Welcome to Elder Sign, a weird fiction podcast by Clay Temple Media. I'm Brendan Buddha. And I'm Glenn McDorman. This episode, we're talking about the early H.P. Lovecraft story, The Statement of Randolph Carter, which was uh, published in the magazine Vagrant back in 1920. This story reads essentially like a testimony that somebody is giving or a deposition that somebody is giving to some policeman or a judge or something like that about some strange events that occur maybe somewhere in Florida. It's hard to say. But Randolph Carter is going to tell us about this strange occurrence he has on a night with his friend Warren. So Glenn, why don't we just get to it? Right. As you say, the story has a, an interesting narrative technique or a storytelling device, and we should be clear about that before we get going. The, the story really is, as the title suggests, an oral statement that's made by this guy, Randolph Carter, to someone, some people who are questioning him, though these questioners never actually appear in the story. Uh, the statement is in response to what Randolph Carter describes as an inquisition. And he indicates that what's at stake here is his permanent detention or possibly even his execution. So that's a big deal. So it's clear that he's either speaking during some sort of police interrogation, right? But maybe even during a criminal trial, we, we, we're never going to find out sort of what is the room in which this story is being told, but it is meant to be a transcript of someone's speech to other people. And the story opens with all of this, but the thrust of it is that our narrator, Randolph Carter, doesn't remember what happened. He doesn't remember the thing that these people want to know about. And he describes this as a dark cloud coming over his mind. But the second paragraph opens with this. Again, I say, I do not know what has become of Harley Warren, though I think, almost hope, that he is in a peaceful oblivion. Carter and Warren have been super best friends for five years, and during that time, Carter has been a partial sharer of Warren's terrible researches into the unknown. That's a, a great phrase. So we know that this story is not going to have a happy ending, though I think we probably knew that just because it says Lovecraft on the written by page. <laughs> right, exactly. There are a few interesting things that Lovecraft is doing in the early paragraphs of this story. The first is to point out that because of this dark cloud on his mind where he can't remember the events that happened, whatever the system that he's caught up in is going to do to him would only go to serve the illusion that they call justice. And it's an interesting idea to think about whether or not somebody is culpable for something they can't remember being involved with. That's the first interesting notion in these first two paragraphs. The second one is, uh, as you pointed out, that Carter hopes that Harley Warren could find a place in peaceful oblivion. And that for Lovecraft here, for Carter, there's no sense of an afterlife. It's better to live in a state or, or be in a state of inexistence, which is, of course, a paradox, than it is to have your soul continue on after death. And this is important to the theme of the story as well, because we learned that one of Warren's interests is what happens to people after they die. Right. This story very quickly is going to be about our existence, our, our mortal existence and how, what happens after that or how we might be able to extend that or something like that. The setting for this story is, as you say, Brandon, the, the Florida swamplands near Gainesville. Uh, Warren and Carter went out one night with lanterns, shovels and some uh, electrical instruments, we'll say. The next morning, Carter was found alone and dazed at the edge of the swamp, right? Warren is gone at this point. And what has happened to Harley Warren? Why Harley Warren hasn't returned? Only he or his shade or some nameless thing that cannot be described can tell is what we're, we're told here. So right away, I'm hooked, right? I want to know what has become of Harley Warren. And I want to know what Randolph Carter has to do with it. Did he murder his friend out there in the swamp and can't remember it? Or is this nameless thing what's responsible? Uh, though I will say, I think that this opening could be cleaned up a lot. Uh, this is, you know, one of Lovecraft's very early stories, and it's still got some amateurish storytelling, especially right here at the beginning. Maybe that's something we'll talk about in the discussion. 
there is a lot of repetition in the story, a lot of confused imagery. I mean, we get the kind of packing list early on in this section. And later on, when Randolph Carter is unpacking his bag, he seems surprised by what's in it. And this could be Lovecraft trying to indicate like a confused state of mind, but also it seems like he just didn't go back and write a second draft of this story. Yeah, it'll be fun to spend a little time in the discussion, you know, being story doctor uh, for this story. Well, right now, we're going to get a narrative of everything that Randolph Carter does actually remember about this night. And, and we start with the friendship between Carter and Warren, uh, as well as some descriptions of Warren's interests. And Carter describes those interests as weird studies, which should definitely be the name of an academic journal devoted to weird fiction. We may have to start that journal, but, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see how things are going a year from now. And we also get here a, a real classic trope of the, the genre, the, the library of obscure occult books. Uh, something Lovecraft loves to do is make up the names of such books. Everyone on the planet knows the Necronomicon, right? Uh, but Lovecraft doesn't actually do that here in this early story. Uh, most of Warren's books, we're told, are in Arabic, but the book that serves as the, the impetus for this story is written in characters that Carter has never seen before, and Warren will not tell him what is in this book. Lovecraft calls this book the fiend-inspired book, which is a really interesting play on the way Christians talk about the Bible as being divinely inspired. So I think Lovecraft is trying to do something here to point out that this book is some kind of anti-Bible in some way. It is inspired by a fiend. I also love, with this whole library of strange and forbidden books, this phrase, you know, forbidden subjects. I rack my brain reading, <laughs> uh, reading a phrase like that, trying to think about what a forbidden subject might be. And one of my great wishes for Lovecraft when I'm reading him is always to say just like, can you name one forbidden subject, please? <laughs> so I can uh, have some sort of anchor with what you're dealing with here. Yeah, right. What is it? K kinesiology? Uh, microbiology? What are these forbidden <laughs> right, subjects? Right, right. What, are we, what, what do they hold You know that science hasn't discovered? I mean, we're way past the age where people are, can do surgery and vivisections and uh, get corpses. This is the 19th. 20s where medical schools are you know open and and so i don't know what the forbidden subjects are i'm, I'm afraid i'll never find out but they're they are usually dealing with the occult in some way yeah absolutely and i think you're right to to suggest that this is an antiquated notion not even just for us literally 100 years after lovecraft wrote this story this was an antiquated notion when he was writing this story when he was writing this story this was a notion that that would have been only at home maybe a century and a half earlier but not even in his own day well, Carter, Carter says that he no longer remembers what it was that they were researching, but something he thinks now is actually a mercy. He's glad he doesn't remember this. But he does know that he participated not out of actual inclination, not out of any actual interest in the forbidden subject, but out of reluctant fascination. And then he goes on to describe his relationship with Warren. And he says, Warren always dominated me. And sometimes I feared him. And we're going to see this type of relationship between two bachelor men several more times in Lovecraft and, and also elsewhere in the, the genre of weird fiction. This comes up explicitly in Herbert West's reanimator. I mean, this is this story feels like a dry run for ideas that Lovecraft is going to pick up later in his great novella that's also a self parody of himself and this is the kind of stuff that he's playing with as he's writing herbert west reanimator i also have to wonder what kind of friendship these guys actually have or if they're friends at all this seems very strange to me how weak carter is and comes off in this story is problematic i think for the whole story itself it's it's almost too weak of a character to carry this story around yeah, like the forbidden subjects, this character archetype is always something that's hard for me to to imagine. Is this is kind of like dominated, servile person who doesn't even necessarily seem to like the dominant partner in this relationship and isn't interested in what they're doing and even often knows it's wrong, uh, which is a, a kind of an, another level where Lovecraft does take this story when we get to Herbert West. I, I've just never understood why those characters don't 
just walk away from that. Uh, there's not enough here in this story to really talk about that. But I think, you know, eventually when we do read Herbert West Reanimator, we're going to spend a lot of time probably talking about exactly that, looking at the the character of the narrator and maybe asking some of those psychological questions I think will be really interesting. But for now, this narrator, Randolph Carter, really uses this as a, a, a bridge. It's a, it's a really a bridge for Lovecraft to finally tell us what Warren was actually researching. And, and Carter says that, I remember how I shuddered at his facial expression on the night before the awful happening, when he talked so incessantly of his theory, why certain corpses never decay, but rest firm and fat in their tombs for thousands of years. So this is this theme here of bodily decay and questions about uh, the afterlife and maybe even how we might have eternal life. And Carter continues here. He says he doesn't fear Warren anymore, but now rather he fears for him. Uh, because of whatever it is that actually happened out there in this swamp. Uh, and again, there is there is some sloppy storytelling here. Carter says he doesn't remember what they were researching, uh, but then gives us pretty specific research questions that they have. Uh, but it does do a good job of setting up this creepy story. I'm, you know, I, I've got goosebumps at this point while I'm reading the story. Okay, so something in this book, which Warren uh, got from India only about a month before the mysterious event, something in this book compels Warren to go in search of a cemetery in Big Cypress Swamp. There's a classic, thick, Lovecraftian description here that sets the mood. I think we'll probably workshop this description a little bit in the discussion. Uh, Warren and Carter find an ancient cemetery that hasn't been disturbed or even visited for immemorial years, he writes, uh, perhaps even centuries. And we get a, a great phrase here, lethal silence of centuries. I don't know what that means or in what way the silence is going to be lethal, but it is super evocative. I mean, it makes me feel something. I love this line. I have this underlined and I just have great line as my note for it because it's hard to find some really glowing positive positive things to say about this story this line is one of them lethal silence of centuries i guess we have to assume that somehow the ancient indians from india settled in florida sometime in the deep past and created a cemetery in a swamp that's that's the most i can make of like the logic of this story is somehow this book that warren finds is reveals something about this cemetery in the United States in Florida. So it's a little strange if you think about it. And and when we get to the discussion, I will be pointing out that Lovecraft claims to have transcribed this from a dream that he had. Like this is just him writing out a dream. And there is some real evidence of dream logic in this story. And I think this is the first big example we get of that. Well, listeners know I'm always fascinated with world building. That's kind of what I gravitate to primarily in any kind of speculative fiction. So I am super interested in whose cemetery this is. Uh, and I am looking forward to getting that in the discussion because we get this description of the cemetery uh, that you know, you know, evokes a particular picture of a of a specific type of cemetery. There's a, a repellent array of antique slabs, urns, and cenotaphs, and these are all overgrown with moss and what Lovecraft describes as the gross luxuriance of unhealthy vegetation. Uh, maybe not the greatest of phrases, but I certainly love that wordplay there. Well, Warren has picked out a tomb that he wants to open, and the two of them get to work. Once they have it open, they find some stone steps covered in ichor descending down into a dark pit. And now we're ready to get the horror of this story. This is the point of the story where the repetitious imagery really takes over. We have two mentions of the waning moon almost in, in the same paragraph. And this waning crescent moon comes up maybe four or five times in the span of two pages. It's a, it's a little too much. And then we have this sentence here where they're unpacking their bags, where Carter says, I now observed that I had with me an electric lantern and two spades. Did he not pack his own bag? I mean, there's just so many questions that saying I observed what I have raises for an audience, especially when we're given this information before that it at this point in the story, it really turns into like, uh, trying to understand what is going on with Randolph 
Carter that I don't know we get a full explanation of. Yeah, I have some thoughts about this. I'm going to save them for the discussion when we really unpack this. But it is there, there's, there is some sloppiness that's happening here. Well, obviously, Warren wants to go into this pit beneath the cemetery. I do, too. So that sounds great. Uh, but what he doesn't want is for Carter to join him. And there's a, a, a pretty long speech here addressed to Carter about why Carter has to stay up top. And it all really comes down to the fact that Carter has frail nerves and a weak will. And so Warren indicates that he has some expectations about what he's going to find down there. And he tells Carter, you can't imagine what the thing is really like. This is a great tease, right? I'm, I'm, my heart is racing at this point in the story. So Warren is going down there without Carter, but he has brought telephone wire so that the two of them can talk while Warren is exploring. And he promises to narrate everything that he finds. There's a great description of the tomb right as they're entering it that I want to read out loud because uh, Lovecraft does have some really great imagery here. He says, our lanterns disclose the top of a flight of stone steps dripping with some detestable ichor of the inner earth and bordered by most walls encrusted with niter. It's fantastic imagery. Uh, I really love it. Again, though, with this section, we are getting uh, the vagueness of what it is they're actually looking for. This idea of the thing, we don't know if that is a a placeholder in Carter's mind because he can't utter what it was that they're actually looking for or if it's just called the thing, if they're just talking about this ghoul, I think, <laughs> is probably my reading of it as the thing. But bringing somebody like Carter along to an investigation like this seems like a terrible idea to begin with. And now I'm beginning to really question Warren's judgment as a, as a research lead on this project. Yeah, he's basically just a mule. He just needed somebody to carry more stuff. I almost wonder, why not actually just get a mule? <laughs> then bring <laughs> right. Carter with you. Right. <laughs> well, we're at the climax of the story here. Uh, Warren starts down the stairs and, and rather immediately breaks his promise. Uh, he says absolutely nothing over the phone. And he just leaves Carter to sit alone in silence in a creepy cemetery in the middle of the swamp. And Lovecraft deploys his descriptive powers again here. We, we can really feel the silence surrounding Carter. And when Carter begins to think that there are weird shadows that can't possibly be coming from the moonlight. We're right there with him getting creeped out. This part of the story is all really excellent. And all of this wears on Carter. And finally, he can't take it anymore. This creepy silence, the weird shadows. And he uses the phone to call Warren. And Warren says, God, if you could see what I'm seeing... Of course, he then proceeds, you know, not to tell us anything about what he's actually seen. And he's never going to because Lovecraft's whole MO is to leave these things to our imagination as much as possible. But Warren does give us a, a slate of, of half descriptions, and I'll just read some of them. It's terrible, monstrous, unbelievable. And he says, it's too utterly beyond thought. I dare not tell you. No man could know it and live. Great God, I never dreamed of this. But then Warren's descriptions stop for a while, even while Carter continues to pester him. I mean, really pester him with questions. And then Warren's voice comes back. Carter, for the love of God, put back the slab and get out of this if you can. Quick, leave everything else and make for the outside. It's your only chance. Do as I say and don't ask me to explain. This is really terrifying i think but of course carter doesn't listen and he stays and he does ask warren to explain well, carter also not very good at following instructions it's pretty clear the mule would have done a better job so warren has to yell a few more times for carter to just flee to just get out of there and then warren's final words are curse these hellish things legions my god beat it beat it and then silence but Carter still doesn't leave. He, he keeps trying to talk to Warren through the phone. He whispers, he mutters, he calls, he shouts, and he even screams for Warren. But still, nothing. And then, after a long while of silence, there is a clicking on the phone receiver. And when Carter says, Warren, are you there? The response from an indescribable voice is simply, you fool, Warren is dead. And that's the last line of the story. And it's the last line of the story. Uh, it's a great line. It's a great ending to this story. But I have no idea, really, what happened to Warren. I don't think anybody does. 
And it's really unfortunate that uh, Randolph Carter is destroyed by hearing this voice on the telephone. That doesn't seem like a strong enough reason to go insane is to hear a voice on the other end of a telephone in a tomb. Uh, although I will say that uh, the very end of the movie, Session 9, which is just a voice changing on a recording uh, on an old tape, <laughs> is enough to make me nearly go insane. So I don't know. Maybe I can relate to Randolph Carter that I want to. Um, yeah, I just want to point out one one paragraph here that is a little problematic in the in the writing of this story when Carter is sitting in silence after the phone goes dead. Uh, Lovecraft writes this. After that was silence. I know not how many interminable aeons I sat stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into that telephone over and over again through those aeons. I whispered and muttered, called, shouted, and screamed. It's just that this, this language, this, this, this is the same sentence written over twice. And he's going insane before he hears the voice. And so it's just, it's a weird thing to put in this story. And I think a lot of our discussion is going to be caught up into, as you said, Glenn, kind of story doctoring this. And I think we did a fairly good job of this when we covered our last Lovecraft story for our Patreon supporters, Dagon, and, and did a similar thing. These early Lovecraft stories are full of his ideas that he becomes famous for. But there's a lot of writing that is just, I don't know, plainly speaking, bad. And uh, for me, as a person who's interested in, in the craft of writing and interested in weird fiction, one thing I notice is that people copy maybe the wrong things from Lovecraft's style. And it's really fascinating to dig deep into what he's doing and elevate the good stuff and learn to avoid the bad habits of Lovecraft. So but I do want to start by just giving some context from this story. As I pointed out during the recap, Lovecraft claims that this story is transcribed from a dream he had. And th this information can be found uh, in the Penguin Classics edition, uh, which I'm reading, The Call of Cthulhu and other stories, which has a lot of contextual notes by S.T. Joshi, who was a big uh, Lovecraft scholar and weird fiction scholar. But this leads me to a question. Do you think Lovecraft has any additional knowledge that Randolph Carter doesn't have? Does he know the things that Randolph Carter doesn't know? Or did he just scribble this down as a dream? Does Lovecraft know what the thing is, what happened in the tomb? Well, this is a really great question because it's it's getting at the the story process here, and this is one. This is something that's really awesome that we have uh, from all of the letters that Lovecraft wrote that we so often actually know what it is that created the germ of his story idea, and we can even see him working on drafts, and we can see quite a bit about his his writing process here. So, so here with this story, Randolph Carter, we're able to to see that this is. Uh, this was a bad dream that he had, and of course, I think right. We all know, you know, dreams are are so visual; they're so imagistic, but they don't often contain a lot of information, and there's not a lot of motive about why things are happening. And so we can see here where he's taken some images he had in his dream and has thought about them and tried to turn them into a story. And I'll point out a couple of those places where he actually is doing that. But that said, I don't think he knows what the thing is in this pit under the under the cemetery. And I don't really even think that the statement of Randolph Carter is much of a story in its own. This is uh, this is really a, a scene from some other larger story. This should be uh, about the middle of act three of uh, of a longer novella and this is just lovecraft a uh, young lovecraft juvenile lovecraft really uh, writing a darn good scene or trying to write the best scene he can from this image that he has without really having much understanding of what the actual plot is or what is motivating his characters or who those people are and i have to say that just you know, if this is something that someone turned into to me in like a creative writing class, I would say this is really well done. So I do want to let Lovecraft off the hook there just a little bit. But just to go back to the, the, the real heart of your question here uh, about what does Lovecraft know about this world that he's constructed? We talked about the cemetery already. And this is where I think we can see that Lovecraft has made some moves, has actually tried to think about what is the world that he's building here, this speculative world. In in the in his account of this dream, this is something that happened with him and one of his friends, but it was in a, a New England colonial cemetery. But here he has moved it to 
Florida rather than New England and put it in this swamp. And the only thing that I can think of, the only reason I can think for doing that, Lovecraft loves, of course, to write about his native New England. So the only reason for doing that, I think, is that what he's interested in here is the specific location of this cemetery and how that might have something to do with bodies not decaying, something to do with eternal life. And this has got to be the myth of the fountain of youth, right? Which is reported to be in Florida. Uh, this is, you know, Ponce de Leon going from the, the Caribbean to Florida with Spanish uh, settlers, Spanish explorers, conquistadors in search of this fountain of youth. I don't know if that's actually true, but it is a, a myth. It's a story that we that we tell. So, I, so then I have to think that this cemetery, given the fact that it is described in pretty European or, or Western civilization terms, uh, is actually an old 16th century Spanish cemetery and that possibly what we have here is supposed to be the the bodies of Ponce de Leon's expedition or something like that. That is a, a really, really fascinating theory. I had not made that connection at all of why Florida for a place to go to investigate why bodies, why some bodies don't decay, though all bodies decay. So there's, there's a problem there. I guess I Lovecraft is drawing, uh, if we're, if we're going to take your reading here, Glenn, on the imagery of the mystical knowledge of the Indians. Uh, this is uh, an old trope in adventure fiction. You go find, you go to Nepal or you go to Shangri-La and all these places, northern India, where these people have secret ancient knowledge of the world. Well, well I will say one reason we know that the why this book is not the Necronomicon is because we know the Necronomicon is Arabic and this is explicitly not an Arabic book though. Warren may have a copy of the Necronomicon in his uh, library. So I can see somehow uh, a much longer story where this rare book from India is pointing the way to the fountain of youth on the sun discovered continent. And that'd be a really fun story actually. And I think, I think you're also really right to point out that this is, a very good scene of a much bigger story as we've been talking about. And I don't know if Lovecraft ever really returns to this. We did say that he returns to some of the themes and, and uh, characters in Herbert West reanimator, but the world that he builds for this story, I don't really think he ever returns to. And I think it's a weakness of the story that Randolph Carter doesn't know anything. And he's the one telling the story. We might have gotten better information from a mule. <laughs> so let me just ask you some diagnostic questions about this story. I do think in some ways that this is a, a tighter story than Dagon. But, you know, in a general sense, in what date ways does this story work for you? And on what levels does it fail for you? And the first question I have to, to, to open this up is, do you think the story is told from the right point of view? Is Randolph Car Carter really the right person to tell this story? There seems to be a very sane witness to all of these events who has already been questioned. And so why is Randolph being questioned and why are we getting the story from his point of view? This is a classic trope in all sorts of literature, right? This is how Sherlock Holmes stories are told, not from the perspective of Sherlock Holmes, but from the perspective of his assistant, uh, his less capable assistant, Dr. Watson. Of course, we've seen this also with Poe in The Murders in the Room Morgue. There's a whole trope here in literature of having the assistant be the person who tells the story about what the great man is up to. And it often works very well, but I don't don't think it works here because for that to work, the narrator, the assistant narrator has to be a reliable narrator in the sense of having access to all of the information that this is the person who is is really the only person who is able to cobble together things you yourself, gentle reader, may recall from newspaper articles at the time, but I was there and I can put it all together for you. Is is That's kind of the conceit of that trope. Here, it's the opposite. He's a completely unreliable narrator. He doesn't know anything. And I think as we've been kind of dancing around, some of this is because Lovecraft doesn't know because he is really just transcribing these dream images. And, you know, perhaps if he had had more time to uh, think about this, that he could have fleshed all of that out. And then we wouldn't need Randolph Carter to, to have this memory problem that I do think is really a hindrance. It's really an obstacle to this story. This story would actually have worked better if it had been Randolph Carter's narrative, the narrative from this assistant character, but that he knew everything and that uh, the gimmick is not 
that uh, you've already asked me all these questions and I just can't remember, stop pestering me, but is, well, I'll tell you everything you want to know, but it's going to take a long time for me to explain and I have to give you all this backstory that is the entire, the whole rest of this novella that we both, I think, yearn for. And that then all of this stuff that Lovecraft has already written is is middle of act three stuff as we're getting towards the, the conclusion of, of this story. Again, this is, you know, this is just a, an amateur effort at a, at a scene. And so that's where the, there are some of these problems. I agree. I really think that this story would benefit from even the point of view of the investigator who's taking this statement and then goes back out to the site and goes insane. I mean, that would be the the kind of classical Lovecraft story is the, the investigator who uncovers this event and then has to go and figure out what really happened. And that would allow for the gaps in Randolph Carter's memory and this dark cloud that that's hovering over him. But just in general... Do you think it's a good idea to have a character who can shed no real light on the event that they're talking about narrate a story? Is that ever a good trope, ever a good technique to use in your mind as as a reader? Well, I don't want to say never, but let's say almost never, right? I certainly can't think of an example of a story like that that is compelling that is good and you know we've really been talking this whole episode about this story being kind of a, a dry run for herbert west reanimator and lovecraft solves all of these problems in that in that story where his narrator does know exactly what's going on and in fact has a motive for telling that story i won't ruin that for anyone who hasn't read the story yet but there's it's it's all motivated and has a purpose all of that is is missing here uh, but i don't know brandon it almost sounds like you might actually have an example of a story that does this that is good Good in your back pocket here. I wish I did, but <laughs> but I don't. I I really thought a lot about it, and and I think it is something that is classically amateurish in writing. Is when you have a good idea and you haven't worked it out yet, the way you solve it in order to write the story is to have your character not know what's going on because you don't know what's going on. And I think everybody has to write 10 of those stories when they're yeah. trying to figure out how to write. Um, and so this is not uh, uh, in any way like a bash on Lovecraft, but I think this is something that people who admire his writing pick up from his writing and don't realize that as a writer, you have to know what's happening in the story, but you have to write stories where you don't know what's happening to even learn how to write a story in the first place. So I have just a few more questions about the story as we're, as we're walking through it and working on it. The sole image of the story that is repeated numerous times is that of the waning crescent moon. I think it's mentioned at least three times. We get this odd sentence of the wan waning moon, which I think looks better on paper than sounds out loud. I love that line, but I was like, I don't know if I could really write that down <laughs> myself. I don't think it sounds very good, but I really like the imagery. Do you think there's any meaning behind this waning crescent moon? Why do you think it's repeated so much? And what is Lovecraft doing with this image, if if anything? Well, I'll just say off the bat that I don't think there's any actual significance to it. It's, pro it's just part of the image, probably part of the dream that Lovecraft had. Hey, look, moonlight is is creepy. Uh, and so that serves the mood. Some of the places where he's deploying this, though, is also about he's he's trying to actually explain how the scene is functioning, how where the light is coming from, that anything is happening, which seems a little too explainy and unnecessary. It's almost as if uh, he's a, a dungeon master explaining to the scenario to his players so that they can make decisions about it. He probably needed to write that down for himself while he was writing the story, but that's kind of discovery writing that should have been cut from certainly by the third draft of this story. Uh, but I also think he just likes... I think he also just likes the sound of some of these words and likes playing with some of the poetry of his descriptions with uh, things like alliteration and, and doing some things even with the, the meter, the cadence of these sentences, which is which is fun. These are fun word games, but it certainly doesn't need to appear on every page of the, the story. It's it's too repetitive and I think almost gets in it, its own way. That's what that's the one image that really jumped out to me as occurring too often in a five page story. I mean, you maybe if it's important in five pages, you can say it twice, but you should describe it differently. I mentioned during the recap that some of this repetition was a real problem for me, like the the bags, like Randolph Carter mentioning what they brought with them out to the tomb in the very beginning, and then saying, I observed now what I had in my bag. 
to me that is something that could have totally been changed. I don't really like the repetition, but you said you had something you had it you had thought that there might be a reason why Lovecraft is doing some of this in the story. And so if some of the repetition is just a little clunky writing, some of it might be meaningful. And I would love to hear your thoughts on on why some of this is meaningful. Yeah, so this only jumped out to me on my third read of this story, which is actually probably my 20th read of this story, but my third read of this story to prep for talking about it with you today. There's a line at the end of the fourth paragraph uh, this that precedes the beginning of the real narrative here. And I'll just read this. I have no distinct memory of it. The picture seared into my soul is of one scene only, and the hour must have been long after midnight, for a waning crescent moon was high in the vaporous heavens. Then And then following this, the rest of the story, there are all sorts of weird phrases, things where he says, I observed myself doing X, or I seemed or I seem to be, I appear to be. And it finally occurred to me that what is happening here is that Randolph Carter is describing to us this one scene, this picture that is seared into his soul. He's not remembering. He has this flash of an image and is describing it to us like he's watching it on TV himself and is telling us, the reader, what it is that he's seeing, which is a terrible way to tell a story, but is exactly what Lovecraft himself is doing as he is writing down this dream. All of that should have been cut from the narrative because it's so confusing when you get to these lines and you think, wait, why Why is Carter saying, I seem to have been terrified by that? Don't you know if you were terrified by that? Right. You were the one who was there. Right, right. Yeah, I have the same exact problems, but that's a brilliant explanation. And I totally missed that, that both the, the method under which this story was written uh, of uh, observing a dream and having the character observe this scene burn into their mind explains a lot of why the imagery is the way it is, why he's obsessed with the moon, maybe why uh, he observes himself, why he seems to be feeling something, which anytime you distance a character from their emotions uh, by appear or seem or observe, there's an instinct where maybe it feels like there's some intelligence there in the character that there's self-reflection but it lacks immediacy which never really captures my attention the way i think it's intended to i'd r r much rather have the immediacy of the feelings of the character than the intelligent third like self-reflective third-party observer of the character and that that really is a flaw of this story so i guess glenn i just want to ask as a as a final question here do you think this story works ultimately and in what way do you really enjoy this story? And in what way would you, if you could just sum it up quickly, would you go back and just fix it if you could? I really do like this story. And it does work for me on a, a number of fronts in a number of ways. But it also could be improved. And of course, this is one of the explicit purposes of our podcast is to be doing every once in a while some of these story doctoring type episodes for us to hone our own craft. And I'm, I'm sure there are other writers who are listening to the show as well. And this is far from being the worst story draft I've ever read. There is a good story here. And the way to improve this is simply to cut probably about 15% of it. I mean, almost the whole first page could be boiled down to one sentence. and it's But it's a sentence that is already there, right? Uh, uh, and I think that's true for most of the stories, that that there's good stuff here. It simply needs to be uh, excavated or the, the, the fat needs to be trimmed off from around it in order to, to make it tighter. Then, you know, some of the sentences should be rewritten. There's a lot of, of passive voice in this story, too much uh, for it to work. The character motivation could be cleaned up a little bit, right? These are all things that we've talked about. All of that said... It, it is evocative. I see all of these images and I get all of my senses working while Lovecraft is is giving us these descriptions. And even though I, I complain about 20% of it being in the passive voice and maybe being overwrought, 80% of it is awesome and, and is really all that, that he needs there. And he does have a good hook and he does have a good mystery here and he has a way good way of teasing it and making me want to know what's going on and i think he also is really quite consistent with the the theme right that there's that the limited emotions that we do get from carter resonate with the revelation that we get at the end of the story as well so this there is a good story embedded here it just needed someone else to give it a, another proofread right i agree i think my criteria for whether or not you know, a lot of weird fiction works, quote unquote, is whether or not I enjoy it. And I do enjoy Lovecraft. I did enjoy this story. But when you really dig into it, you can see 
how his influences have really gone out into the world in both good and bad ways. Uh, and that's something that really interests me is how influ- influential Lovecraft is for for many horror writers and looking at the lessons they learned from him. I I think you pointed out some really good ways that this story could be fixed. Basically, it needs a rewrite. I mean, if you're cutting 15 or 20 percent of the story to make it tighter, it'll need to be expanded again. And I think when you cut the fat from the story or have an editor do that for you and say, like, this is not working with the story, you see the parts that really work that you can then expand and build the story around. And that's that's the whole point of drafting and revision. And I and this story reads like it just needed another draft or two. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. And so I'm glad, glad we covered it for this podcast. But that's going to do it for this episode. Once again, I'm Brandon Buddha. And I'm Glenn McDormand. As always, you can find us and our other creative projects at claytemplemedia.com. Head over to the Clay Temple forums and let us know what you thought of the statement of Randolph Carter. Let us know how you think the story could have gone or where it might belong in a large in a longer story or a novella. So this brings us to the end of the stories that Brandon and I had selected, had, had handpicked it to really get Elder Sign started. And so from here on out, every story that we cover is going to be chosen by our network's Patreon supporters in uh, bi-monthly polls that we're going to do at the end of every odd-numbered month. And uh, we're very excited about what we've got coming up. We'll talk more about that when we get to our next regularly scheduled episode. But even before we get to that episode, we have a bonus episode, a, a special episode that has been commissioned by one of our Patreon supporters. And this is a really fantastic story of Karnacki the Ghost Finder by William Hope Hodgson. The story is The Haunted Jarvie. We had an absolute blast covering this one. We were really grateful for the, the extra commission to, to cover it. Uh, so we'll be back a week early with the that episode. And then the following week, we will be back with our regularly scheduled episode voted on by our Patreon supporters, and it won the vote. And so what this means is that we're going to get back to back William Hope Hodson episodes. I guess our Patreon supporters really love William Hope Hodson. Uh, and that story is going to be the girl with the gray eyes. And in that episode, we'll talk about what else is uh, to come. Uh, and if you want to look ahead, you can visit us on our website, claytemplemedia.com slash elder sign uh, to see the whole schedule of upcoming episodes but until then until next week we greet you and say farewell <laughs>